morning. You guys doing okay? Everybody good? Good? All right. How's the weather out there? I wore flip-flops today because I'm trying to like will the weather into being better. You know, I know it looks probably really odd. I'm wearing this little thing and then I have no shoes on, but uh, just like this kind of positive thinking thing. I'm like, if I just don't wear my shoes, maybe the sun will come, but we'll, uh, we'll see. So if you're new here, uh, you started coming at a good time. We just wrapped up a book of the Bible from the Old Testament two weeks ago, 1 Samuel, a, a little bit lengthier of a book. A uh, pretty long narrative, took us quite a bit of time to get through it. I, I hope you enjoyed it. If you were here, I enjoyed teaching it and learning from it. And we're kind of making a dramatic shift. We, we shifted over into the New Testament, into a very short book of the Bible. It's a letter written from a guy named Paul, who was pretty important, wrote uh, the majority of the New Testament, maybe 65, 70% of the New Testament. And uh, we started off last week talking about this letter. And just very, very briefly, let me kind of set the scene a little bit. So Paul is writing this letter to a group of churches in a region in, in what is modern day Turkey. It's a region called Galatia. And in this region, Paul had helped start a lot of churches. And this is kind of whole, you know, Paul's whole shtick in the Bible is he would go around, travel around, uh, spread the gospel, start churches, hand them off to other people. And then he would kind of touch base with them over, over the years, just make sure they're doing okay, send them letters if they weren't doing okay. Sometimes he sent some, some rebuke letters, which is what this one is, and, um, and he would correct them. And so what was going on in this region, in, in the churches of Galatia, was Paul had taught them the true gospel. And the true gospel, the good news is this, that we are saved by grace through faith. There's no work we can do to save ourselves. It is by the work of Jesus Christ. We're saved simply by believing and living in that relationship with Jesus. That's it. So he had established that truth, which that's what we talked about last week. That's kind of a fundamental of the Christian faith, right? But behind his back, a lot of Jewish people who had become Christians, they're called Judaizers, had come in and they were teaching the opposite. They were teaching all the Greeks, all the Romans, that it's not that we're saved by grace through faith, we're saved by following the law. We're saved by our Jewish customs. We're saved by following the things that Moses taught us in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And that contradicted what, what Paul had taught them, okay? So he is writing this letter to, to correct them. So that's what we talked about last week. And then we, we brought up this, this idea or this question of, so if we know that we're saved by grace through faith or we believe that, then, then in our personal lives, how do we know? What is the evidence that we've been saved? And so we talked a little bit about that at the end of the lesson. Now, continuing this on, Paul is still defending himself. He is still building a case for his ministry, and, and he is correcting these, these different people in these different churches. And what we're going to talk about a little bit today is, and, and this is for the next couple of chapters in Galatians, is, is kind of what we talked about in 1 Samuel, that there are two paths, right? There's the path of dependency on God, which is the path that Paul teaches us and tells us to follow. The other path is this dependency on us, that we can fix it, that we can save ourselves, restore ourselves, and, and that we can be morally right on our own. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to ask this question, um, whose, whose works do we really trust? Whose path do we really trust? Whose ways and, and where do we put all of our hope? And not just 90% of our hope, where does 100% of our trust and hope go? We're going to discuss that a little bit today, okay? So you should have got a notes handout when you walked in. Everything is in there, everything. Every good idea you could ever think of is in that notes handout that you received on your way in. That's not true. Everything is up on the screen. If you have a Bible right after First and Second Corinthians, you have the book of Galatians. And if you have a smartphone, just click on the Experience Community app, uh, Sermon Notes. Everything is right there. Scripture and your notes are right there in front of you. Good to see you. Glad you guys are here this week. Let's uh, pray. Let's dive into chapter two. And we'll just get really personal today and deep. You're going to love it. I'm going to love it. It's going to be good, okay? Let's pray. Father God, we love you. Lord, we thank you so much. I thank you so much for everyone in this room this morning, God. Sincerely, Lord, I thank you that people made it a priority to be here. I thank you, God, that the room is full. I thank you that um, you have given us this safe space to come and meet and worship and learn about you and, and be with like-minded people on a journey. 
I just pray that you bless us this morning, God. Keep your hand on us. Lord, we pray not only for our church, pray for every single church in our city if they are teaching the word. We pray for our other campuses and the churches in those cities. And Father, we just pray that at the end of all this, that we have honored you, God, and that in, in some small way have blessed you, Lord. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. Pray all these things in your son's name, God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's read a little bit. Let's go back and um, talk about it, okay? Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. I went up according to a revelation and presented to them the gospel I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those recognized as leaders. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running in vain, but not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus in order to enslave us. But we did not give up and submit to these people for even a moment so that the truth of the gospel would be preserved for you. Now, from those recognized as important, what they once were makes no difference to me, God does not show favoritism, they added nothing to me. On the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel for the uncircumcised, just as Peter was for the circumcised. Since the one at work in Peter for an apostleship in the circumcised was also at work in me for the Gentiles. When James, Cephas, that's Peter, and John, those recognized as pillars, acknowledged the grace that had been given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to me and Barnabas, agreeing that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They asked only that we would remember the poor, which I have made every effort to do. Okay, what is going on here? First, we see that Paul went for the first time to Jerusalem about three years after he got saved. 14 years have passed and he returns to Jerusalem. So what's going on is this. Not only was Paul's authority to teach the gospel being challenged and attacked, the Judaizers, these Jews who had become Christians but believed you had to follow the Old Testament laws, this group of people were telling others that Paul and the original disciples were not on the same page. They were against each other. That wasn't true. That was gossip. That was slander, which is a sin. So, Instead of, you know, Paul taking to his social media to blast these guys and gossip and slander back, what he did was he collected evidence and he presented this evidence to the people reading this letter that not only did the original disciples agree with what he was teaching, they, they affirmed his ministry. They wanted to send him out to the people who are not Jews. So here's the thing. Paul didn't necessarily need the other disciples' approval because he was already approved by God. He went to Jerusalem to, to, to be on the same page with the other disciples because Paul understood it was very important for the church, not just the church, the church to be unified in their theology, unified in the majors that they were teaching. So here's the thing, we, we, we have to act like adults here. A lot of us are in this room because we don't like the denominational thing. And I'm not trying to knock on denominational things. I'm just saying there, there are preferences, there are differences that probably led all of us into this room versus a uh, Church of Christ church or a Baptist church or a Pentecostal church or a Catholic church or whatever the case may be. Now, there may be some preferential things that we prefer more about this setting. And that's okay because we're human, right? One of my best friends is David Young in, in, in uh, North Boulevard Church of Christ. They don't, they don't play musical instruments there. Not my cup of tea, but it's his cup of tea. That's fine. We can, we can agree to disagree on, on little things. But it is extremely important that the church, talking about the universal church, right? The global church. We have to get on the same page when it comes to the minor, or, uh, when it comes to the majors of our faith. And one of those is our doctrine, our theology, and one of the most important doctrines and important pieces of theology is that we cannot save ourselves by our works. It has to be the grace of God in his works. Now listen, the closer and closer the end of time comes, the more and more the church needs to be unified on these majors. 
We need to get our act together. And I'll tell you what, this, this city actually does a pretty good job with that. I'm really good friends with, with several pastors from several different denominations, and, and I think they're okay with me. So we, we do okay with that. So there was a couple of people that traveled with Paul. One of them's name was Jose, which is a fun name, but we don't know him from that. We know him as Barnabas, which was actually a nickname. I didn't know that until last week. And so this nickname, Son of Encouragement, was given to him by the disciples. That's a good nickname, right? Another individual that traveled with Paul was a young Greek man named Titus who became very, very influential in the first century church. He was Greek, so he wasn't Jewish, and he traveled with Paul as well. Now, when these guys arrived to Jerusalem, all these Judaizers, these Jews who had become Christians, started pressuring Titus to get circumcised, to follow the Old Testament law. And Titus said, no, thank you, which probably several reasons why I said no, thank you, but no, thank you. And I shouldn't have said that, shouldn't have said that. But he said, no, thank you, because he knew that we are not saved by following the law. We are saved by grace through faith, what Paul was teaching. So, so he said no to, to the law saving him. And all of this is making Paul a little upset. When you go back and read this opening part that I just read, you can, you can pick up on the snarkiness in Paul's tone. There is some sarcasm, especially in that first part. He says, um, those who are recognized as important, and then he goes, makes no difference to me. Uh, I mean, that's sarcasm. That's being a little snarky. He calls Jesus's inner circle the ones who are recognized as pillars, and there's probably some sarcasm and snarkiness in that as well. And what we, what we pick up from this and something we should learn as is, is, is Christians is Paul is to be honored, right? One day, if, 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 if you're a believer in here, one day you'll get to meet Paul in heaven. And, and that's gonna be neat. And we should, we should honor what he has done and the sacrifices he has, ma- he has made. But here's the balance we have to strike, not just with Paul, with all humans in our life. We are to show honor where honor is due. And the Bible says to outdo each other with honor. So that's a good thing. It's a good thing to say yes, sir, and no, ma'am. It's a good thing to to respect pastors. And I'm not saying that because I am one, but just any pastor you meet, it's good to respect your boss or, you know, the president of your company or the president of the United States or whatever the case may be, to to give honor where it is due. The Bible says we are to do that. I'll do each other with honor. Where it becomes dangerous, though, is when we start to idolize people, when we put them on a level that is is far higher than what any human should be on in, in, in idolizing level. And we do this really, really good in the United States. We make idols out of virtually everything. And that leads to a lot of disappointment because people are imperfect and they're going to let us down. So we honor people, but we, we should not lift them to a level that puts them up there so high to where when they fall, it, 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 it breaks us and tears us apart, right? And so we read about these people in the Bible. We have a tendency to idolize the people in the Bible, but they were people. They were humans with flaws. Sometimes they got angry sometimes. They were sarcastic, right? Gives us, gives us hope, right? So, so Paul was angry and, and he was justified in his anger. This is a righteous anger, a good anger, if you will. Paul was angry because false teachers were coming in and undermining the gospel. Paul was also mad because it seems like the other disciples, the apostles, were, were, were not being as hard on the false teachers as they should have been. So even though we can sense and infer that Paul was, was, was angry and being a little sarcastic, a little snarky, he wasn't out of control. Not only was he not out of control, the things he was mad about, he had every right to be mad about. So there is a time for righteous anger. Not all anger is bad. Some anger is completely justified. Sometimes there are people that have this, this very non-biblical view of Jesus, that Jesus was just like this like dreadlock-wearing, hippie, herbal tea-drinking guy that just hugged everyone all the time. Hey, we just, you know, like, just want to hug you. Now, here's the thing. Uh, God is love, the Bible says. Jesus is God. Therefore, Jesus is love, right? He's the perfect embodiment of love. Um, Jesus also got really angry sometimes, and justifiably so. You know, everyone's familiar with when he got mad in the temple because the temple had become more of a business than a church and he overthrows the tables. Uh, One time Jesus calls a woman a snake because she wouldn't leave him alone. 
There's another time that Jesus is in the temple and he's in the corner making a whip. You know what you do with whip? You whip things. So everyone's like, what is Jesus doing over there? And he's like, I'm about to show you what I'm doing. He's making a whip. He's going to drive people out of the church because he was mad. So, two things I shouldn't have said in this sermon. So one, there is a time for righteous anger. The trick is we have to be slow to get there. And when we do get there, we need to make sure that the Holy Spirit tames our tongue, controls our tongue. Just James talks about this. So not only did Titus not feel compelled to follow Jewish customs or convicted, the other apostles did affirm Paul and they affirmed his ministry. The only thing they asked, Paul said, is they said, do not forget the poor. And if you go and read the other works of Paul, one of the biggest works that Paul did uh, is he, he collected money from all over his travels and he would bring it to places that needed that money, uh, that, where people were hungry, people didn't have adequate clothing or shelter, and he helped in that. And what we learn is, is a, again, a fundamental principle of Christianity in the church. First and foremost, the job of the church is to share the gospel, first and foremost. That is the most important thing we do. More important than any, and I'm not trying to say this because I'm doing it right now, this is the most important thing that the church does is, is to, to share the gospel and for us to go out and share the gospel in the world around us. But in order to earn the opportunity to share the gospel, we also have to be serving our city. That's why Jesus said, I want you to feed the poor and, 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 and the hungry. I want you to clothe the naked. I want you to visit the prisoner. That's in the gospels. And so that part is connected and that actually opens up the door for us to do the most important thing that we do. And that is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, all right, next part. But when Cephas, again, that's Peter, came to Antioch, that's not the one down the street, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For he regularly ate with the Gentiles before certain men came from James. However, when they came, he withdrew and he separated himself because he feared those from the circumcision party. That's the Jewish Christians. Then the rest of the Jews joined his hypocrisy so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were deviating from the truth of the gospel, I told Cephas in front of everyone, if you who are a Jew act like a Gentile and not a Jew, how can you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? We're going to get into something. Um, we're going to get kind of ground level here for a second. So in his defense, Paul's defense of his calling from God Paul presents a, a very, I'm sure must have been a very tense situation for Paul. Paul had to call out Peter, who was the head of the church. He was the top dog in Christianity, right? And so Paul had to publicly and to his face call out Peter. Why? Because Peter was being hypocritical because he hung out with Gentiles, but when the Jews came around, he would act like he didn't know the Gentiles and he would give all of his attention back to these Jews, right? The religious people. And so he was being hypocritical. Now, the problem with Peter in this instance was Peter was afraid that people wouldn't like him. You know, stronger than drugs, stronger than alcohol, stronger than, you know, prescription pain medications, whatever. The biggest addiction in the United States right now is the addiction to affirmation. It is the addiction to being affirmed for people liking us. So Peter did not want anyone to not like him. So in his desire of acceptance, he ended up partnering with people who were against Christianity. What that means is this. If you and I try to walk on both sides of the fence in the world and in a relationship with Christ, and if we try to appease the two camps all the time, what's going to inevitably happen is it will, it will compromise your faith. It will compromise your walk with God. So Paul says this in Romans chapter 12, if possible, if you're a Christian in here, if possible, you and I are to live at peace with everyone not just people who vote like us or walk like us or live like us or talk like us or think like us. We are to live at peace, with, if possible, with absolutely everyone around us. 
That's good. Jesus also says this though, you will be hated for my name's sake. Don't be surprised when they hate you, Jesus says, because they hated me first. So in essence, the word of God says this, if possible, we need to live at peace with absolutely everyone we come in contact with. But Jesus says, not everyone wants to live at peace with you. That's what the word of God says. There is this danger in trying to please everybody. And so, because Peter was being hypocritical, he was a leader, other Jewish Christians were seeing him, including Barnabas, and they were following his lead. So the reason why Paul had to confront Peter in front of everyone is because if they didn't get a grip on this hypocrisy, it would hurt the integrity of the church. Now, the number one reason people say that they don't go to church is because there's hypocrites there. Now, we can take that, two, there's two sides of that coin. The first thing is we shouldn't act like hypocrites, right? The second thing is wherever there are humans, there will be hypocrisy. At church, at your job, at whatever restaurant you go to after this, in your school, everywhere. Wherever there is humanity, there's going to be sin. There's going to be something bad going on because we're imperfect humans. But to the best of our abilities, we as Christians need to make sure that we live up to what we say we are. Uh, we must be humble. See, if we place ourselves on this holier than thou pedestal, when we inevitably do make a mistake, we're gonna have a long way to fall. If we're humble and we keep ourselves, maybe this is why Jesus said things like, the last will be first and the first will be last. And when you walk into a party, don't sit right next to the host, sit far away, right? Be humble. Because when we're humble and we make a mistake, there's not as far of a distance for us to fall. Be humble. Also, we need to be willing to be held accountable. You need to give people permission in your life. Hey, if I'm acting like an idiot, if I'm sinful, tell me. We need to be open to that. And we need to be willing to also tell other people, hey, man, you're not doing this right. You need to correct this. You need to do this better. And we can, we can hold each other accountable. So Paul calls out Peter because Peter was asking people to live a certain way to a certain standard that he wasn't even willing to live by. So it's like if there's a, a, a bunch of Christians and they constantly talk about how sexually uh, uh, evil this one group of people are, right? How deviant this one group of people are. And they say, man, this group of people are so sinful and so evil and they're tearing away the fabric of society, but please don't look in my computer room because I've been looking at porn all night. Hey, this group of people over here are so bad and we, we call them awful things. And we say, and listen, I'm not condoning anything. Sexual sin is sexual sin. All these people over here are so bad and so deviant and everything is so wrong, but hey, never mind the fact that I have 30 years of Playboys up in the attic. So here's the thing. The thing is this. We cannot expect the world around us to live up to a standard of morality if we are not moral ourselves. You guys with me? It's like when you say a bunch of swear words and then get on to your kids for saying the same thing. That's kind of hypocritical, is it not? It's do as I say, not as I do. And when a bunch of Christians stand back and go, why is everyone so mean? Because we are not setting the example, right? Not that it's all on us. People have to be responsible out there as well. But when we talk about why don't we see more kindness in the world, and then if you're working in the food industry, the last shift you ever wanna work is that post-church shift on Sunday, right? Because Christians can be jerks and they don't tip very well. So if we wanna see kindness, we have to be kind. If we wanna see morality, we have to be moral. If we wanna see true love, we have to manifest true love. We must first demonstrate these qualities if we expect people to live to that standard. But how can I call you to live to a standard that I don't wanna live by myself? How can I get on to you about your sexual choices, right? And your sexual decisions when I'm not living moral either? Let me tell you some examples, right? And why we need to clean up our act as Christians. So in the Muslim world, about 50% of all Muslims lose their virginity before they get married. This is a 2012 study, so it's a little outdated. In 2012, 50% of all Muslims lost their virginity before they got married. About 65% of all Hindus lost their virginity before they got married. In the Christian world, it was 85%. 
So we sit back and we take our moral high ground and we look at everybody and talk about how evil they are. But the numbers show that in the Western world and in Europe, the most sexually deviant group of people are professing Christians. That's a problem. That is a problem. If we want to see a change, we have to first live those things out. Everybody good? Okay. Be more seats in here next weekend. So <laughs> we are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet because we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Christ Jesus, when we ourselves have believed in Christ Jesus. This was so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no human being will be justified. But if we ourselves are also found to be sinners, quote unquote, while seeking to be justified by Christ, is Christ then a promoter of sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild those things that I tear down, I show myself to be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I may live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. Now there's some tough stuff in there and we'll unpack it because some of that can be a little hard to understand. The first thing is this, Paul uses a term that pretty much every Jewish people use during this time. And it was very, very derogatory. The Jewish people had a knowledge of God that other people didn't have. And instead of sharing that knowledge, they just called other people sinners all the time. And they said, whenever they would say Gentile, they would follow it up with sinners, Gentile sinners. Paul uses this phraseology, not because he feels the same way, but because he's pointing out that we are saved by grace through faith, not through the works of our Jewish customs. Now, what do we learn from this? We learn that just because, listen, the only thing that differentiates us in this room versus everyone outside of this room, I'm, I know it's an oversimplifying way of putting it, but the only thing that differentiates us from the world is that we have a knowledge of God's grace and saving power. It is not our job to walk out into the world and look down our noses on those that don't have that knowledge. Just because we have that knowledge and they don't doesn't mean that God somehow loves us any more than them. So the Bible says that Jesus didn't come to condemn and look down on people. Jesus came to save us from condemnation. And we as Christians, our job is not to go out and call everyone sinners and evil and terrible and you're all awful. Our job is to present to them the gospel that saves them, liberates them from that sin, liberates them from that condemnation. Jesus loves all people. It says that it's not his desire that any perish. That means that God wants a relationship with everyone you see, everyone you see. And it is our job to hopefully connect the two, to bring those people into an atmosphere where they can get to know Jesus Christ. So Paul writes this, we're not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus. And we're kind of introduced, a lot of you in this room, maybe not a lot, maybe some of you in this room have never heard the word justification. It's a very churchy word, right? And sometimes it's thrown out and it's not always explained very well. What that means, justification means that we are, we are declared right. We're declared okay, innocent, if you will. So what Paul is saying is this, we're not justified by the works, but by faith in Jesus. This means that we have the 10 commandments, okay? And if you're not familiar with the 10 commandments, Exodus chapter 20, that lists off the 10 commandments. We have the 10 commandments, which is the moral law. This is the perfect way to live. As a Christian, I should do everything within my power to follow those 10 things. But I also know that I'm never going to perfectly follow those 10 things. So what do we do? What we do when we realize that we are incapable of being perfect, the logical thing is to get behind the one who is capable of being perfect. And he justifies us. And he stands up and gives an account for us. It's like if there was, it's like if we were in a courtroom, right? 
If we're in a courtroom, God is sitting there as the judge. I am about to be judged. As God is about to judge me for eternity, in my mind, I know I'm not perfect. I know I have not followed all the rules perfectly. I know this. And so I'm sitting there and I'm waiting for my judgment. But before God lays judgment on me, Jesus, my defense attorney, steps in front of me and says, do not judge Corey based on his works. Judge Corey based on my works. And we are justified. And the judge goes, Corey's innocent. Corey's good. Good and faithful servant, come on. You've done everything that I want you to do. I haven't, but it's me standing behind the one who has. Does that make sense? That's justification and that's a beautiful thing. So the argument against grace and faith and justification, the argument against that from the, from the legalistic people were, if you keep talking about grace and church, everyone is going to go buck wild. Everyone's gonna start having sex with everybody. Everyone's gonna be doing drugs. Everyone's gonna run amok. They're gonna be speeding. They're gonna be doing all kinds of crazy stuff, right? So if we talk about grace, people are gonna run wild. And so the problem is this. If one says they have been saved by grace through faith, but they make excuses to sin, they have not experienced salvation by grace through faith. Because people with genuine faith do not make an excuse to sin. People who have genuinely given their life to Jesus Christ, though we know we're going to be imperfect, we strive to live in a way that honors God and honors the commands of God. We talked about this last week. Just having an intellectual knowledge of who Jesus is is not saving faith. James told us this, right? Even the devils in hell believe, but they're still in hell, James says. But when we genuinely put our faith in him, saving faith, we will not make excuses for our sin and we will strive to honor God in everything we do. Is Christ a promoter of sin? No. So salvation should lead to dependency on Jesus. Paul says this, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. That means that through Christ, you and I are liberated from the weight of having to save ourselves. So again, realizing that we are incapable of perfectly following the 10 commandments should lead us to be utterly dependent on the only one who can follow the moral law. I know I can't do it, but he wants me to walk with him. So I'm gonna get really, really close to him. I'm gonna be utterly dependent on the only one that can live out morality to its perfection. The only one, that's the only one that can save me is the one who can perfectly live out God's commands. So I'm gonna cling to that person. So salvation should lead us to dependency on Jesus. Let's go further. Salvation should also lead to transformation. Talked about this last week, evidence. Paul says, look at this. I was crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I say this every single baptism lesson, there is really, really bad theology that a lot of Christians buy into. I absolutely hate when Christians do this. Christians will go, well, we're all just broken, dirty, wretched, awful sinners. No, you're not. That doesn't mean you're perfect, but it says that our old, Romans chapter six says the old you has been crucified. It's dead. That old title of broken, nasty, ugly, dirty, wretched, all this stuff, that has gone away and we are no longer under sin's claims. That's what the word of God says. And we are empowered to live, it says this in Romans six, in a newness of life. You're not dirty, wretched, awful, broken, all this stuff anymore. What is the point of salvation if Christ leaves you in the exact same state that he found you in? What's the point? It's not biblical. So we need to change the way we use that verbiage. Salvation changes our identity and it leads to a lifestyle that puts God first. And when we have a new identity and when we put God first, you will see amazing change, transformation in how we think, how we act, how we treat others, how we treat you know ourselves, how, how we relate with God, all of that will dramatically change. And Paul says, I live by faith in the Son of God. The key to unlocking salvation, the key to unlocking lasting change in our lives. I love how he says this. 
It's by putting our faith in the only one who loves us and gave himself for us. How do we know we can trust Jesus? Who else has hung on a cross for you? Who else did it while we were still sinners? If following the rules, if simply following rules saved us, then Jesus served absolutely no purpose. Absolutely no purpose. But since you and I know, and if you didn't know before this morning, you're like, man, I learned something today. I am very not perfect. Um, Now that we realize we are imperfect, we just need to lean on the one who is for restoration and for salvation and for help and guidance. Let's go back to something we talked about earlier. This is what got Peter in trouble. We are to live at peace with others as much as possible. Romans chapter 12, okay? We live peaceably with each other if possible. But if we overly seek the affirmation of people, I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, eventually you will compromise your biblical integrity. Because the ways of the world do not run parallel with the word of God. They run, they, they, they run against it. They butt up against each other, okay? So eventually there's going to be a collision there. And we need to make sure that we are biblically grounded the way we should be. It is also vital to know that Jesus, Christians, and the teachings of the Bible will always garner a unique level of opposition. You can take out garner a level of opposition and you can just put hatred. There will always be a unique hatred for the things of Christ because people just want to pick on us. No, there's is, there is a deeper spiritual component to all that. But there will always be a unique hatred just for that of Christ and of Christians. And again, Jesus said, don't be surprised when they hate you because they hated me first. And he was perfect, okay? So we don't need to be shocked by the fact that there are going to be some people that just don't like us. Now, this is where we get gets important. If you and I understand that we're targets, you and I understand that we're targets. If I, um, if I um, understand I'm a target, I don't wanna give any ammunition to the people who wanna shoot at me. So if people say that Christians are hypocrites, we need to strive really, really hard to not be hypocrites. If we know we're going to face opposition and accusation and hostility, we have to live in a way that doesn't validate the accusations. We have to live in a way that doesn't validate the hatred against us. And so this even goes to the point of we have to live above reproach. And the Bible says we even have to avoid the appearance of evil. Well, Corey, I went into the bar at one o'clock on Saturday and you know came out at 1.30, but I didn't do anything, but it looks like you did something. And what you do is you create, you open up a door for people to make accusations. Again, some people think that we're just way over the top and legalistic here. It's usually people who've been divorced six times who make judgments on this, but we have a rule here to where if you're married, you don't ride in a car with someone of the opposite sex without anyone else in the car with you. That's just a rule we have here. And people go, oh, oh, dude can't hang out with other women besides his wife? No, I can't. And that's why I've been with my wife for 27 years. And, and, and now, now I'm not saying that to boast on me. I'm just saying, if we don't have any guardrails, the, the propensity to go off the cliff gets a lot higher. Have some flipping guardrails in your life, Right? Live above reproach, be wise. Because if we don't do that, if you see me driving around one day and I have you know, someone half my age riding around with me in the car and it's not my wife, you're like, why? And it opens up a door for questions and accusations and, and things to be said against me. So why put yourself in that situation? So we must be humble. Again, if we put ourselves on a big pillar up here and and we make idols of ourselves or we let others make idols of us, when we inevitably make a mistake, there's gonna be a long way to fall. So let's be humble. Let's be honest. Let's not put expectations on others that we are unwilling to live up to ourselves. Why? Because hypocrisy damages the church. It damages you, it damages me. It damages the, 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 the integrity of God. Not that God did anything wrong, but we're the people that represent him. So we need to make sure that we, we, we live to the best of our abilities and remain humble. Also, salvation by grace through faith is not a license for us to continue living a sinful lifestyle. 
Paul even says it right here. Is Jesus a proponent of sin? No. In another book of the Bible, he says, should we, should we sin more so there's more grace? No, that's crazy. Sincere faith should make us more dependent on Jesus for his help, for his forgiveness, for his guidance, for his strength. And genuine faith will produce a transformation. If one is genuinely giving their life to Jesus, they're gonna be on a road, right? And that road leads them closer to Christ, further away from evil and sin. And we should see that in people. We should see that in ourselves, that the, the, the further I go down this road, the more I should be acting like Jesus and the less I should be acting like the world. And so we should see a transformation in people's lives. Here, here comes the problem though. And I love what Paul said here at the very end of this chapter. He said, if I set aside the grace of God, right? If we set aside the grace of God, let me, let me rephrase that. If we set aside our dependency on God's works, if we set aside our dependency on, on Jesus for everything, what are we left with? We're, we're left with ourselves. We're left with our ability to save ourselves. We, we're, we're left with our ability to restore ourselves. We are left with our ability to be morally right. That last one is intriguing to me because you and I live in an era of what's called moral relativism, which means what is right to you may not be right to me. And that contradicts, that doesn't work on a practical level. It may be right for you to have sex with a 15 year old girl. That doesn't work for me. I have a 15 year old daughter. But if we have different standards of what is right and wrong, it contradicts, it becomes absolute chaos. Hence the Western world right now, right? Because when we give up on God's ways and we depend on our ways, that just creates a path to failure. It creates a path to disappointment. Quite frankly, it creates a path to just utter destruction and chaos. If we set aside the grace of God. On the other hand, look at this, man, look at this. On the other hand, if we will place our trust in the one who loves us and gave himself for us, this is the road that we're on. He will save our soul. Before we get to eternity, he will change us. Sanctify means that, that we are set aside for God's purposes that not only does he change us to, to be more like him, he gives us a meaning. He gives us a purpose. We have value. We, 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 we have validity for life, right? We have a reason to wake up in the morning. Not only does he save our soul, he changes us and gives us purpose. So when we stand in front of God, <laughs> even though we know that we have been imperfect, but when we stand in front of God, God will say, welcome home, good and faithful servant. Welcome home. Not only are we saved, we are changed and we are made right. For eternity, we are made right. Now, when I wrote this lesson, this was my last slide. And I said, man, look at that. Look, look how churchy I am. Save, sanctified, justified, boom. Look at that. Not bad for a punk kid that, you know, weaseled his way into being a pastor. Like, boom, look at that. Got it. And as I was praying and I was, I was concluding this, I'm not trying to be all, you know, Jesus-y on you guys this morning, but I feel like the Lord gave me a couple of questions, maybe to ask myself, but, but I want to share them with you as well. The first one is this. If someone were, were, were to see the darkest chambers of my heart, if someone were to see how I act when no one's around, if someone were to see how I act on vacation and I know that no one's gonna know what I do for a living, do we live out the faith that we claim to possess? If you could see every part of my mind and every part of my heart in this room, can you and I say, yes, I'm not perfect, but I do live out the faith that I claim to possess. That's a question I think we need to ask ourselves. And then here's where I felt like God was really working on me. And, and again, I felt like I was supposed to bring this to all of you. If we're not there yet, I wanna ask, what is keeping us from completely trusting God and his work and his ways? What is keeping us from giving 100%? There may be some of us in this room who have given God 98% of us, but God is not satisfied with 98%. He wants 100% of us. What part of our life are we reluctant to give him? 
I don't know how to answer that for you. You know, having two teenage daughters, I'll be honest with you, but my future, my future is just hard to trust in the hand of God sometimes. You know, when you get to be in your mid-40s, you got teenage kids, you're like, you know, you're starting to a little bit look down the, the, the barrel of, of, you know, in 15, 20 years, I'll be retiring. Do I have any money in the bank for that? And you start to, you start to think about these things. And then you want to start taking things and grabbing them and, and fixing it yourself, right? And I'm not saying we shouldn't work. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do our end of it or have skin in the game. B- but sometimes I need to sit back and go, Lord, you're the only one that knows my future. Do, is, is there a part of us? Is it your finances? Is it your marriage? Is it, is it your dreams? Well, I want to do this. Maybe that's not what God wants you to do. What, what, what is it about us? What corner of our heart, right? Are we reluctant to let God in? And if there is a part of our life that we're reluctant to let God in, let me honestly ask ourselves this morning, do we think we can manage that better than God can manage that? Do we think we can handle our future or our finances or our children or our job or whatever it is? Do we think we can handle that better than him? Let me tell you where I'm at in life right now. And maybe this is the same for someone in this room. Maybe not, maybe it's just me, but I'm gonna tell you where I'm at. Whenever I have created my own doors and I walk through my own doors, those doors always lead to chaos. Whenever I make my own way, whenever I create my own path, right? Or whenever the door seems to be locked, but I kick it down or, or, I, or I jimmy it open, right? Whenever I do that, it typically leads me to a place that, that is not good for me in the long run. So I'm in this place in my life right now. And, and I'm gonna see if, this, if anyone else identifies with this. I'm in this place in my life right now, and I kid you not, when I pray, I say this, God, I'm, I'm just jiggling door handles. If the door opens, I'm gonna assume that you unlocked it and I'll walk through. Whatever it is, I'll walk through. Lord, if I jiggle it and push a little bit and nothing happens, I'm gonna take it that you don't want me to go that way, so I'm gonna go a different way. So all I'm trying to do right now, I'm not perfect, guys, but I'm just trying. All I'm trying to do right now is jiggle the handles, right? That means do my end, right? So if we're gonna hear from God, we gotta talk to God, right? If we're gonna pray for God to bless us financially, we better be willing to work, right? Because that's why we were created, was to work. So things like that. So we have to do our end of it. But my end of it is, God, I'm I'm exploring I'm checking door handles, but Lord, if you want them open, open them. If you don't, let me know that they're locked and I'll go somewhere else. And what I'm trying to do in my life is with every corner of my heart, these corners that have cobwebs and it's dark and I haven't touched them in a long time, I'm asking God, God, take the light and shine it on those things. And whatever lies in that corner, I I just wanna give that to you because I'm realizing that my ways of handling things are not working. So I want to give it all to him. I don't know if that resonates with anyone else in this room, but, but we need to get to a place to where God 100% and we trust him. Why can we trust him? We trust him because he is the only one that truly loves us and gave himself for us. That's it. Would you bow your heads with me, please?